Hi, Grant Tomasha listeners. This is your host, Mil Invasionov. We have an important programming note before getting to this week's show. This is the final episode of season 11 of the podcast. Believe it or not, today's show is our 150th episode of Grant Tomasha. I want to give a huge thanks to our team for helping to put this show together week in and week out. But above all, I want to thank you, our listeners, who make it all worthwhile. As we've done for each of the past five years, we'll be taking a much-needed break for the summer. We'll be back in September with brand new Grant Tomasha content. If you like what we do, please rate and review the show, tell your friends, and subscribe to Grant Tomasha wherever you get your podcasts. With that, on to this week's show. Unabashed. The most unpredictable. Becomes a headline. The most volatile. Outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grant Tamasha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. I'm your host, Milan Vesha. Gurdjur and Das is one of India's best-known authors and thinkers. He had a celebrated career in business, most notably as the CEO of Procter & Gamble in India, before devoting his full attention to writing. He's the author of numerous best-selling books, including India Unbound, The Difficulty of Being Good, and India Grows at Night. He is also the author of a brand new book called The Dilemma of the Indian Liberal, in which he recounts his own professional and intellectual journey and traces how and why he became a liberal. In telling his own story, he also narrates the story of an India that continues to struggle in its own quest to become a successful liberal democracy. To discuss the ideas in his latest book, I am pleased to welcome Gurcharan Das to the show for the very first time. Gurcharan, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me. So before we get into the nitty gritty of the book, I would be remiss, I think, if I didn't ask you about these most recent general elections. We're recording just a couple of weeks after the results have come out. Um, When Narendra Modi catapulted to national politics back in 2013, 2014, you were pretty optimistic about what he might be able to accomplish in terms of economic reform, and you talk about this a bit uh, in your new book. Over time, uh, your hopes in this government began to dim. I think demonetization in 2016 was uh, was an informative event, but perhaps there were others. Uh, tell us how you see the prospects for economic reform in this new NDA government helmed by Mr. Modi. Uh, well... First, thank you for having me. And yes, Milan, I have followed some of your writings. And so it's lovely to meet you. Um, Well, the election result was an odd one because the victors were sad and the losers were happy. And this was really uh, a result of expectations. Uh, the winners wanted to get 400 seats and they ended up with 290 for the coalition and 240 for the BJP. So the right nationalist Bharti Janta Party's uh, seat count came down from 303 to 240. So this was certainly a disappointment for them. And it, for me, it illustrates the limits of uh, of nationalism and ideological uh, sort of aspiration that um, it the 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 people in the end. Uh, there were in each state there were different uh, reasons why the BJP lost or won, and but the un, the common thread everywhere was an undercurrent current of anxiety about jobs. Now, <clears throat> you know, India has grown well over thirty years since the reforms. In 1991, it has grown at 6% a year. Now, this is damn good for a democracy. Uh, But, I mean, it's lifted 450 million people over the poverty line. Extreme poverty has come down below. Extreme poverty is defined by the World Bank's international norm of $2.50 a day. $2.15 
uh, has come down is almost negligible. It's the, many, some estimates are five percent, others are close to two percent. So it's vanishing. Now this is, and the middle class has gone from ten percent to thirty percent. So that's the good news. The bad news is that we still have a lot of people who are on the farm. In other words, 45% of the workforce is in agriculture and half of it is surplus. They had aspirations created by Mr. Modi in 2014 when he talked Vikas of getting better jobs. You know, unemployment figures are not very useful in India because they hide uh, underemployment. And so um, that's really the issue. And the only way, the only answer is to create an industrial revolution, which India has still not created. So as I look forward, Milan, uh, from this election result, uh, there are two voices in me. The one voice is actually very happy that democracy has taken the right turn, that we were a liberal democracy before, but we were veering towards becoming illiberal, and now we have a second chance, hopefully, uh, because it's a coalition government which needs more consensus and so on. But the other side of me says that <clears throat> with less of a majority, and and given the fact that Mr. Modi and his peep, BJP, has not been particularly consensual in, to do reforms, it will, you know, it will require heavy lifting now. It's not inevitable. India may be the fastest growing economy in the world today, but it's not inevitable that we are going to, to do, we can create this industrial revolution. So we have to take about half the people on the farm who are surplus, and they can't all go into IT and services. So we have to do the good old-fashioned work of factory, building factories and actually exporting the mantra of all the countries that have been successful in the last 75 years since the war, Second World War has been one in one line the export of labor-intensive manufacturers. And India's share is dismal, less than 2% of world exports. And it is these exports, ultimately, that create the factory jobs. And so it will require reforms, um, and some of them are tough reforms. Uh, it will require a consensual attitude to reach out to the opposition, reach out to your, you can persuade even your coalition partners, but now you have to, you need states behind you. You need the opposition behind you. <clears throat> you know, Margaret Thatcher, lesson she gave, I know she's not very popular right now, but she gave the best lesson for a reformer, that a reformer she said she used to spend 20% of her time reforming and 80% selling the reform. And in the case of our reformers, they haven't even sold it to their party. They haven't sold it to the political class. Forget about selling it to the people. So the reformers have failed. Even Deng in China was going and he was selling the market and, and the reforms based on the market. So... Uh, so there's a side of me which says that now the job will be a little more difficult, but this time I hope he takes a lesson from this uh, this election and tries to follow Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Thatcher's uh, dictum to sell the reforms at least to the leaders of the opposition so that, you know, you can sometimes tire out people who don't disagree with you by just trying. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> That's not his nature. I realize. I, I was gonna I was gonna ask you about this a little bit later in the conversation, but actually maybe now is a better time. Um, as I was reading your book, you you described this this really interesting moment. I'm guessing it was sometime probably in the early 2000s. You were uh, contemplating. Um, taking the plunge into politics. And you describe a moment where you set up meetings with Sonia Gandhi, who was, of course, president of the Congress, as well as with L.K. Advani, who headed the BJP at the time. And you you describe both meetings as fiascos in their own ways. Um, what, 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 what happened that convinced you that politics was not, not the right path? Was it this... Uh, a discrepancy between your beliefs and the the the, the belief you had in, in that reform would actually be possible if you were to join. What was it that 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 turned you off? Well, I realized that really um, our 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 approaches are different. The politicians looking at the next election, and I'm looking at the next generation. So there's a mismatch. One is a 2020 cricket match, and the other is a five-day test match. And so my approach was the five-day test match. And and really, both left me very disillusioned. Uh, and, and, and so I... I, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I could spend time giving you a nice masala story about how, what happened in each case it's actually in my in my memoir another sort of freedom which came out just a few months before the book uh, the dilemma of the indian liberal in my memoir i've recounted in great masala detail with relish and humor the the my meetings with both these leaders and and so um uh, i realized that also neither had a, any use for me. I was just too much of a reformer, and I was like a, rec, a, a, a an old record that was stuck, you know? The 78 records, you know, used to get stuck, or the, sorry, the seven, yeah, 78 RPM ones used to get stuck. And I, I belong to that ilk. And frankly, what, what made me uh, <clears throat> realize, I mean, I had quit my job at PNG. I was running at that time, you know, I'd run PNG India and I was managing director of PNG Worldwide. And they were grooming me for higher responsibility at the time. And there was an there was a interview on NPR radio uh, as I was going to the office. I turned on the radio and I'm listening to this interview and the reporter is saying that the reforms in India are in trouble. This is, by the way, 1993, 94. And he's saying that um, um, the left is asserting itself. The Congress party itself is turning against Narsimha Rao and the reforms are in trouble. And boy, did I get scared because for me, 1991 was a real Azadi. Our Azadi didn't come in 1947. We got political freedom, but we quickly lost our economic freedom. And we had spent, I mean, in the, we had spent, I mean, we'd sacrificed two generations to this mixed economy model, which uh, I feel was more a mixed up economy model and was more of a command economy, over-regulating. And it, uh, so anyway, my point is that um, I, I came back to India for this purpose. And I had, and I had for, for a, almost a decade, I had been writing vigorously in the papers, boringly talking about reforms again and again, and trying to convince people, I said, if the reformers are not going to do their job, at me, maybe I can help. And my columns, I was, you know, mindful. I got my columns were produced in Dainik Bhaskar in the in five Indian language newspapers, 
um, across the country. In, 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 in. And so um, that's what I was doing. And, 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 and you know, my, when the day I was leaving my job at PNG Worldwide in, in Cincinnati, Ohio, that's where their headquarters is. And uh, uh, my boss, who was the CEO of the company, he says to me, <clears throat> now, okay, I'm convinced you want to, I'm 50 years old now when I'm quitting. And he says, that's very young. How are you going to be able to manage it? So I told him I was not going to, I was going to leaving the whole corporate world. I've had enough. I'd worked for 30 years, you know. And I'd had enough, and uh, I was repeating myself and wondering sometimes at headquarters, you know, what headquarters bureaucracies are like. Um, and and so I, I he, he, he told me, actually, he says, well, if you're going to write about the reforms, at least do one thing. Why don't you try jumping in and doing them yourself, you know? Um, Otherwise, you're going to leave the sheep to the wolves, which is how he put it. That, uh, and that's what I'd felt guilty that for almost a decade I'd been writing about it and not doing it. And, uh, and maybe it was time to do it. And I had many advantages. I could, I could speak and everything. I, I want to get to the real heart of the book, which is about your journey as a liberal and your journey with liberalism and all of the, the fits and starts uh, uh, and ebbs and flows that journey has has experienced. But before I, I get into that, I think it might be useful to make sure that our listeners are kind of operating all on the same page. You know, tell us a little bit about how you think about who is a liberal, right? When you say that I am a liberal, this is my journey with liberalism. Um, what does that mean to you? Well, uh, a liberal is, from a human point of view, uh, an open-minded individual who has respect, mutual respect uh, for others and who is tolerant of views that are opposite uh, to his own and um, and and someone who prefers that market outcomes to outcomes in the economy by the government, and and uh, and a liberal is 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 is, 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 uh, is in many ways is middle of the road. He doesn't subscribe. Uh, this is I'm talking about a classical liberal. There is such a thing as a left liberal, and I'll come to that. But he doesn't. Subscribe to either the the left or the right. He's sort of an ordinary middle class, middle of the road. I shouldn't say middle class because a poor person can also be liberal, and a very rich person can also be liberal. So it's more a liberal temper that a person has who's reasonably skeptical about answers that come too easily and who questions and and uh, uh, that that would be one way a quick quick way of, of of summing it up now it is important to differentiate and and how i mean it it it's it's a very i mean you know what i've described is a person who um is 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 is, is Full of common sense, and um, and it really has been the best way to organize political life for the last two hundred and fifty years. It became liberalism became the reigning idea. It be, it was born out of from philosophers, particularly in the eighteenth century, but it became the reigning ideology of the world. Uh, for 250 years, it and caught on country after country, and and uh, it uh, it was in 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 it has had bigger challenges than it's facing today. The challenges 
uh, from fascism, from communism, in fact, all kinds of authoritarianism. Um, uh, and, and, and so that's, that's, then you see, I'll, I'll just to trace it a bit, historically, the left liberal came about really because there are limitations to the market. The classical up to the 19th, almost the end of the 19th century, it, it, this was the way things were going in one direction towards the liberal in every country after country. However, in the towards the end of the 19th century, there were market failures, bank failures, and the in the early 20th century, well, famous great, uh, the Great Depression in America, when uh, Roosevelt had to rescue the liberal economy in the world, and uh, his ally was John Maynard Keynes, and the intellectual ally, and and. Um, these people were earlier called progressives, but they assumed the mantle of the, became left liberals. And the impact of that era of Roosevelt was so great that after the Second World War, the progressives quietly helped in converting governments towards much more of a welfare state. And so, um, it was a government which was have had a much bigger role, but by the mid by the seventies, it was quite clear that a lot of governments had gone too far, and there were uh, serious in, in the serious inability to to pay for these welfare programs that has been established. A lot of them are very good programs, but you have to pay for them, and that really led to people like Margaret Thatcher, there were crises, frankly, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan in America and the rise of neoliberalism. And neoliberalism itself has went, you know, it was the reigning ideology uh, uh, from the, in, in, uh, the Washington consensus, consensus. From the 80s onward, it produced new labor in England, and Blair. But again, they, I think they went too far in de controlling d uh in removing the state from the market and you need that you need the state just as you need the state to tame the market you need the market to tame the state so uh, gorton i want to ask you about this formative moment that you talk about in the book it was in september of 2015 you were in the Madras Museum in Chennai. You are sitting there admiring a Chola bronze statue from the 11th century. Something happens to you at that point, and, and it greatly shaped your views about how to live in the world. Tell us about um, what transpired that day at the Madras Museum. Well, you know, Madras Museum is famous for its Chola bronzes from the 10th, 11th, uh, 12th century. And <clears throat> so there's a wonderful dancing Shiva, and it's called Shiva Nataraja, the king of dance. And the Tandav dance that he's doing is creating the universe, the cosmos, while he's dancing. And um, while I'm admiring the beauty of this sculpture, uh, of a thousand years old, uh, a woman walks in from behind and I move aside and she places a vermilion mark uh, that we would do in a temple to a god uh, in the sanctum sanctorum of a temple. And I'm appalled at what I see and I came outraged. I said, doesn't this woman, she's, by the way, she's barefoot and she's wearing a nice silk sari. Uh, the Tamil upper class women also are like that. And she has placed this vermilion mark on the Shiva. And I said, 
doesn't she realize this is a, not a temple, it's a museum? And she's gone and dirtied the image with what she's done. And, <clears throat> and then I move on and I look at the other sculptures of the Chola period. And with my mm, sort of niggly mind, I'm uh, noticing one sculpture is a bit dusty and they could have cleaned it better. Another one is poorly lit. And so um, there I am. I'm concerned about looking at beauty. And uh, and I come back to the, the, the dancing Shiva. Uh, and, and, and she's still there, I see. And only this time, there's a marigold flower at his feet that she has obviously placed. And on this occasion, I have a different reaction. I suddenly feel embarrassed by my own liberal niggling mind, which has been looking at this object of beauty and the dust and the lighting and everything. And what has she been doing? She's been part of eternity. She has, to her, it is the Shiva Nataraja creating the universe. And, 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 and I tell myself, my God, what, how different we are. And frankly, I say that hers is a much bigger experience, much more meaningful. Now, because I'm an agnostic, I mean, the nice thing about being a Hindu is you can be a very respectable atheist and still be a respectable Hindu. But in her case, I'm suddenly almost envious uh, that I'm incapable of having the kind of faith that she has. So here's a story in which I'm also later, as I thought about it when I was writing my memoir, I had a, a, a different view. I said to myself that this was the moment when I really got convinced that I had become a liberal. And this is how a liberal should treat a person of the opposite point of view. And especially today, when we are very intolerant, the left and the right, I mean, that's why I've lost all my friends. The, when I, when I um, uh, voted for Modi, suddenly I lost all my friends on the left who thought I was some kind of traitor. And then on the right, I criticized demonetization as being voodoo, voodoo economics. And I lost my friends on the right who were always suspicious of me because I had really criticized the 2002 uh, riots in Gujarat, which were done when Modi was the chief minister. So they never fully accepted me. So, but the point here, here is that for the world as we go forward, you know, the left and the right are so polarized that they won't speak to each other. You know, when I was an undergraduate at Harvard, people, you disagreed with people, but they remained your friends. I mean, there was a conservative guy uh, who was wanted America to be much more assertive during the Cold War. And, you know, we were disagreeing with, I disagreed with him and others too, because we thought this guy was going to precipitate a third world war. But we laughed afterwards and we remained friends. Well, that's what's happened in India uh, today. Either you, are, you love Modi or you hate Modi. There's no middle path. And so for a person like me who sees the positive and the negative in the same thing, um, and there's, you know, that I'm, I feel very sad that the guys, and I think both have their uses. The left reminds us of the poor, the right reminds us of community. Both, we, 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 we need both points of view. Hey 
Hey, Grant the Masha listeners. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Putting this show together each week is a labor of love, but it takes a lot of work to put out a great show every week. If you'd like to support the work we do at Grant the Masha, please visit ceip.org slash donate. Don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on your favorite podcasting platform, so you'll be the first to know when a new episode rolls out. Well, let me let me just ask you about, you know, just to put this in an Indian context, because you said that, you know, liberals in India look to their Indic traditions, and in a way they innovated on the classic form of Western liberalism, which kind of gave it a new indigenous kind of character, right? Just elaborate for a second, if you could, on what the Indian spin is to what you've just described. Well, the classical liberalism arrived in India on the coattails of the British Raj. And, but there were Indians uh, from the late 18th century, early 19th century, and the earliest, most famous was Ramon Roy. And on going on for another 100 years to Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi. And all of them, um, the they, they they jumped on liberalism because in some ways they found they were they resonating to the idea of freedom because in india since the upanishads i'm talking about 3000 2500 years ago in the forests these philosophers who were doing mental experiments they were also searching for freedom a human freedom which um and 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 i mean that's so so there's a tradition in india you know the west the genius of the west is expressed in man's relationship to the world man tries to conquer through technology the world that's the great contribution of the west the western mind the eastern mind that is the far east it's the relationship of a human being to another human being, man to man. And so their genius is expressed in the way, well, in Japan, with 34 ways to wrap a present. And in India, in India, it is a person, a man to man, a human being to another human being, into inside himself. In other words, man within himself. And so, there was this notion of inner freedom, which is, which has been sought by people, and the, in fact, my <laughs> title of my uh, memoir is another sort of freedom, and I've gone into it, and of course, it was taken over as a spiritual and a religious idea, to as as moksha, as an end of life, um, but <clears throat> sticking basically to the political idea that the Indian liberals the f- sought that inner freedom, that Gandhi used to talk about being deserving of political freedom from the colonial master. That is, you have to uh, sort of cleanse yourself and your ego and other disabilities that we have as human beings, which, which sort of run amok, uh, that... And and so I I think that it's a it was a major contribution. I think it made Gandhi was successful, and I'm I'm sorry to say that after independence, he he died too soon after independence, because he had translated the liberal ideas of classical liberals in the West into the language of dharma that people could also understand and related it to inner freedom as well. And our tragedy in India is that no one has tried to sell those ideas of of liberalism in the language that people truly understand. Nehru may have tried to do that, but Nehru was too much of a Western-oriented gentleman. And... He, he he did not succeed. And the tragedy is no one else after that 
uh, actually reached out and took the trouble that Gandhi did. So one of the problems today of the, 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 the situation, the ironical situation, that we have a democracy that's turning illiberal, is the reason is our own, the fault of the liberals that they, Nehru was a, was, a, was a great liberal, forget his economic ideas, and um, that we, it, it remained an elite philosophy, liberalism, and it was worsened by the fact that the liberals operated in the English language. I mean, all serious work of India today is done still in English language, whether in the private sector or the public sector. And 85% of Indians don't have access. They're not comfortable with English. And, and so imagine if a person walked in uh, into this discussion that you and I are having, who did not know, he was one of the 85% of Indians who were discussing India, deeply bright, deeply interested. He'd think he was deaf. Something was wrong with the speakers. So, you know, I, I want to ask you a little bit about your education because one of the things you do in this book is you 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 write about these milestones, right, which were these critical junctures in your own life which helped to shape your worldview and your and your journey uh, uh, towards liberalism, as you as you describe it. One of those was your, your decision to go to Harvard, um, which I think had a which, which happened at a very formative stage for you in your thinking. How did that experience kind of push you towards this embrace of liberalism and liberal values? Well, um, <laughs> I can tell you that uh, I was a middle-class kid, and I had got the unbelievable good fortune of getting into a scholarship to Harvard. I couldn't have gone if I hadn't got this scholarship. And also the person who had given that scholarship, I never got to meet that person. So I was left with a deep respect that somebody had given money for my education. It brought out to me the best in American philanthropy. And so I'm at the airport in Palam Airport in Delhi. My mother has tears in her eyes because my flight, I'm about to catch a flight to America. And um, she's saying to me between her tears, now be sure to study something useful. Why don't you become an engineer like your father? India needs engineers. You'll get a job when you come back. And so I arrive at Harvard. I write engineering as my major. And, uh, and, and But I had a roommate in my freshman year who was studying, who was studying Russian literature. And he was reading Anna Karenina of Tolstoy. One day over lunch, he says to me, he says, Gurcharan, if you're going to have an affair with a married woman one day, it should be Anna Karenina. And then he goes on and talks about Anna Karenina to a boring extent. And while he's talking, I'm thinking, look at this guy. He's dreaming of sleeping with Anna Karenina. And here I am calculating pipe friction, mugging up Bernoulli's equation, something is wrong. And so I switch, I get out of engineering immediately in a few, in a month or so, semester's over. And then I realize, I look at the course catalog and it's a treasure chest. And I just go crazy. So what do I do? And you know, this is the great thing about an American undergraduate education, that you can choose first two years, you don't have to do, uh, I mean, you can take anything you want. And so I studied Greek tragedy, I studied Roman history, I studied uh, philosophy, uh, Plato and Aristotle, I studied the history of capitalism, I studied 
Bachhaus architecture. I studied Renaissance painting and even a course in Beethoven's music. And, and a course in Sanskrit love poetry. The, the world's big, most famous scholar was at Harvard at the time. And when my mother heard that I was studying Sanskrit at Harvard, she said, oh, hi, hi, mera munda, my boy. <laughs> a dead language. Now only the dead are going to give him a job. And so by my junior year, even Harvard got a bit worried and the dean called me and he says, now, son, you've got to declare a major and you're going to have to take enough courses in it and then write a thesis. And so I chose philosophy. So then I became a student of John Rawls, who had just arrived and he had a good reputation. And so I graduated in philosophy. But, uh, and, and then I got a scholarship to go to Oxford to do my PhD. Um, however, um, what I, what I think you're asking me is that this education was very unique at the time for Indians. And, uh, and, 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 and it was a true education in a liberal, in a liberal education. And that contributed a great deal to my becoming a liberal, which meant the old idea you know, I mean, of of raise of asking questions. Now, you know, that's that's a, that's part of the Indian temper. The Indian temper, I say in my book, is liberal, and and the reality is the most ancient text, the, the most ancient Veda, the most re ancient religious text is the Rig Veda, fifteen hundred BC, and the most important verse in it is a verse called the Nasidiya verse in which um, there is a person who is asking, who asks the question, so how was the cosmos created? The other guy says, well, let's ask the gods. And he, the, he says, but no, the gods came later. Uh, so how, and, and then he says, oh, but maybe we should ask, the other guy says, maybe we should ask the Brahmins. No, no, they are always arguing with each other. We'll just get confused. And finally, back and forth, they're talking. And the conclusion of this verse is that maybe we don't know. Now, ending any a religious text, ending on that skeptical note, really, to me, was, the, uh, was really a sort of code for cracking the Indian temper. And the temper is a skeptical temper. So I was very comfortable in a liberal education because I was asked to question and, 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 and anyway. So that is my long answer to your short question. Well, let me, let me just build on that for a second because, you know, over time, obviously your views were changed. They were influenced by other things. They were modified, as, as most of ours are. And um, as your journey evolved, you identified a kind of blind spot in classical uh, liberalism, which is community. Uh, and in the book, you talk about how you came quite late to the concept of social capital, right? Uh, something we associate with people like Robert Putnam, for instance. Uh, and the importance of community and social capital in, in, in delivering freedom, not just political freedom, but also economic freedom. What do you think liberalism missed by not properly incorporating this concept of community? Yes, well, that's a good, very good question. It's the one flaw of a liberal person, because that person is always questioning. He's questioning as an individual, and uh, is questioning all social norms, and so. I found uh, when I was reading, actually it's not Putnam, but before Putnam it was Tocqueville, Alexis de Tocqueville, the American traveler, the French traveler who came to America and who really wrote, I think, the best book 
on, uh, it was called Democracy in America. And it's still the best book, I think, on democracy. And what he observed in America was an, uh, an instinctive habit of joining at the local level people who lived in a community and uh, whether it's the joining the PTA, the school parent and teachers association or uh, boy scouts, girl scouts, baseball league. And so Tocqueville called American joiners. And, you know, they had, most of the settlers had come, immigrants had come to America from Europe. And they'd left their families behind. In Europe, there was a lot of family interaction. And so that was took the place of community. But in the new world, these people had to depend on each other. And so the American habit of joining for anything. And when you met, whether you are in a garden club or a book club or whatever, at some point, your neighbors, and you say, oh, there's garbage collecting behind that house, or that light on that street is not working, and somebody would just call the municipality or the town town hall and speak to somebody and, and, and get it done. And so this was really the genius, I think, of American democracy, which Tocqueville said, towards the telling the Europeans, hey, you guys don't have this. And this is really the glue of democracy that brings communities together. And this is what the whole business of social capital is all about. And uh, Putnam actually uh, moans the fact that this is disappearing in America. And this may account for maybe the rise of Trump. And in my, in, in, I, in my case, I also feel it may account for something for the rise of Modi as well. But the, the, the fact of the matter is that you know, the French slogan for liberalism was liberté, égalité, fraternité. Fraternity, liberty, equality, and fraternity. Now, fraternity is what is absent. A liberal forgets about that, and 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 therefore uh, liberalism gets a rap for being elitist, and and uh, and 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 I think that we've got to go back and uh, you know just as the left reminds us of the poor, the right remind, reminds us about community. And of course, Americans do these surveys every year. They survey everything to death. And so one of the surveys that uh, Putnam talks about in his book are, when was the last time you had invited your neighbor over for dinner? You know? And they see he's tra traced a curve going back to where people don't even know their neighbor anymore. And they're too busy. He blamed it, of course, on the the automobile and the television, which made people self-sufficient. They didn't have to. Uh, they didn't. But they moved out of the city. Uh, they went to, to the suburbs, and so that community they were part of got lost. And in the suburbs, a new community, they didn't really. They were much better off, but they didn't really invest in that community. And I was in America at that time, you know. I went to America in 1955, to, uh, and that's where I discovered, for a few years, I mean, I was, my father had been transferred to Washington. Uh, and so, and that was a time when, in Washington, D.C., the, the city was become going black because the white people moved out to uh, Bethesda, Maryland, to McLean, Virginia, and, and so on. So the suburbs came up with the automobile, and then the internet came. And that really <laughs> was like a death knell on the idea of community. So I think that the criticism of the liberal is correct. And in some ways, 
even the rise of Hindu nationalism is a desire for a national community. And this is where Gandhi, you see, died too early. Nobody has sold the constitution of India. You know, people in the villages still think that the constitution fell from the heaven one day. And it's not ours, whereas they don't feel that it's their constitution. But do you feel that that's changing? Because one of the narratives around this election was uh, that the Constitution actually became a bit more of a front and center issue. Uh, it was inadvertent, in a sense, because it was driven by the BJP's Char Sopar 400-seat ambition, which then created a perception, of course, uh, that, that the opposition um, exploited that the BJP was interested in changing the constitution so they could eliminate reservations and so on and so forth. And so there's been a narrative, if you read the op-ed pages in the last two weeks, that you know the constitution actually may have more salience than we give it credit for. Do you, in, do you feel that way in light of these electoral results? Well, well thank you for, for having me, and I've enjoyed it very much. And this is one, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not a conspiracy theory only, the the Dalits in UP, I mean, the, the, not only Dalits, but OBCs, etc., who are benefiting, uh, ironically, uh, big, I mean, they are not truly benefiting, but uh, the political narrative certainly is persuasive. And they... Um, they, 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 they the, 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 the unfortunate thing today is that the market was supposed to liberate us all, in a sense, uh, that, you know, Ambedkar said the Indian village is really a den of iniquity. Unlike Gandhi, who praised the village and wanted village republics, Ambedkar told him that the original sin of Hinduism is the caste system. And he was absolutely right. And he, of course, had his own. He created a wonderful narrative of Harijans, etc., to integrate them into the thing. But ultimately, the idea, the liberal idea, is that, and, and the Dalits, many Dalits, I don't know whether you've read Chandra Bhan Prasad, and what he has been saying, that actually for a Dalit, the only, the real freedom comes from getting a job, and liberating yourself from the hierarchy of the caste. And that's why my, my in migration is such a very big phenomenon and a very good one in the country, because that's what's the, the passport to, to reducing this 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 uh, this problem it's very illiberal uh, feature of of of, of hinduism so so uh, gurtran let me just you know we could probably talk for hours and hours and hours but but let let me kind of move this towards a c conclusion by by asking you to to think a little bit about about the future you know at one point in the book you admit that you have a hard time voting for the illiberal politics of the bjp but at the same time, you don't really trust the opposition, right, in terms of their economic instincts are not where yours are. Uh, as you survey the political scene in 2024, are there any good options for Indian liberals, any viable political options? Well, there are two good things that have come out of this election. One is that whole narrative that uh, somehow the, 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 the ruling party had rigged the electronic voting machines and that, uh, and that these machines were... I mean, this is the same narrative that happened in America about election process. Now, that's been shown to be false. And, and that's a very, very good thing. We are all reassured that those electronic voting machines deliver a fair result. 
The second thing that's come out of this election, so that's liberal for lib me, a reassuring thing. The second uh, reassuring uh, feature of this election is the fact that the Indian voter is is got a reasonably free mind and thinks about he says yes he's he is he hears this message you know a liberal would give a message uh, there are no liberals in, in politics uh, as far except for chandra babu naidu chandra babu naidu is i think the only true liberal and if he was the leader of the opposition i would have no hesitation in 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 voting for for that opposition anyway my point is that the uh, the, the, the the for a liberal there is a limit to hindutva the there's a limit to populism now i don't think modi i wouldn't call him a typical populist leader because he is he genuinely does care for the country and he's done is he's got a track record of success of achievement uh in that and i don't have to catalog catalog it at all because i think your listeners are probably familiar but he also uh has that rhetoric of hindu nationalism has shown to be limited and the the question we come back again where we started is jobs in the country we have a window of about a dozen years when the population will begin to age and that's when when the people who are dependent uh the old people and the very young people on the working age people that demographic change will happen and i am confident that we can actually uh we can actually have a uh create that industrial revolution because the preconditions for it are better than ever and so the reassuring thing is that if modi uh you know when i went to the polls this time i was much like the middle of the road indian i was not committed to either side and there was one voice in me telling me that i can't vote for modi because he was turning our liberal democracy into an illiberal one crushing dissent and all the other things the other voice kept telling me that my god if the other guys come to power they have no vision for the country and they um the best when rahul gandhi was asked the question about jobs his answer was well we'll all the government jobs will fill the vacancies so when he thinks jobs he thought government jobs like which is what a lot a lot of voters in up and bihar think like that and then his final answer was oh but we'll give 100000 rupees to every family so that's not how you give dignity to people and frankly i said that really will require heavy lifting i can't vote for modi and i can't vote for these guys so who do i vote for and that is the liberal dilemma that a liberal is also unelectable because one side will promise free electricity free power from the day he is elected and the other side or uh, you know 100000 rupees for every family or free bus rides for women the other side a liberal will say well look i will create uh we'll help we'll create an investment environment hospitable environment predictable and we'll get factories and people will get jobs i'll invest in education so that skills are developed early with people and we'll go to success and people will say 
look, he's making these promises and they'll only come to bear after he's gone away, five years from now. And so they'll make the rational decision and try and, and vote for the, the, the guy who's the illiberal candidate. So what this election has shown is that that binary, which was in my mind, where I was no hope, has, is not true. That people do think about their, their, what they need over the long term. They think about their children. They think about the future. My guest on the show this week is the best-selling author, Gurcharan Das. Uh, he was previously CEO of Procter & Gamble in India and managing director of Procter & Gamble Worldwide. He is the author of not one, but two recent books, Another Sort of Freedom, which is a memoir, uh, and a longish essay uh, come book called The Dilemma of the Indian Liberal. Um, Gertrude, it's been great to, to, to reminisce with you, to, to hear your, your lessons about uh, being a liberal and liberalism Thank you so much for taking the time. Grant Tamasha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. This podcast is an HD Smartcast original and is available on hdsmartcast.com. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we mentioned on this week's episode, visit our website, grantthemasha.com. Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Mira Verghese is our executive producer. Thanks for listening, and see you next week. This was a Hindustan Times production, brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast.